Last week we discussed the topic and lead us not into temptation taken from Matthew 6, 13, which was Jesus' prayer, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Today, we are going to move further. I don't think today is going to be the end of the, of the message. So, we are going to move further. As we look at the other side of that prayer, because as you say, as they say, the bird, a bird needs two wings to fly. So we've looked at one part. Let us now start examining the other side to see how it impacts our lives. It says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. From what we understand from our discussion last week, <clears throat> we understand that when we've set our mind on doing something, sometimes God will stop us, but sometimes God will allow us. When he allows us, it doesn't actually mean that it is perfect will for us, but because we have insisted, or sometimes we come to God because we, want, we think that we can cheat him, or we can um, curse him, it's like deceive him. We say something else with our mouth, but our heart is not exactly where it's supposed to be. So God will say, hey, so you think I'm, I'm a fool? All right, no problem. So he will allow us to do exactly what he wants to do, and then we will now see the repercussion of what we have done. So when we pray and lead us not into temptation, what we are saying is, God, don't let my will rule my life. It is a case of thy will be done, not my will be done. Even when Jesus Christ faced the same kind of temptation, the way he was able to overcome was by saying, not my will, but your will be done. I want you to understand that as you go through life, even sometimes on a daily basis, sometimes on a weekly basis, that way you understand and you keep in your mind that Jesus Christ had to say, not my will, but your will be done. That God expects us in every situation we find ourselves to put our will aside so that his will can be done in our lives. When we look at, for example, why marriages have problems, you know, it's the problem of, oh, no, I must have my way. It's either my way or the highway. When people are not willing, is that to submit themselves to the cross of Christ. When husbands and wives, because you know what? The Bible says that um, two are better than one. But see, when two are together, and they are bound by, by, by the cord that is Christ. It means that Christ will strengthen them. When it is like when there are issues between a couple and both of them love the Lord, you know, you can easily report the other one to Jesus Christ and say, Father, look at the wife you gave me. Look at what she's doing to me. Or Father, look at the husband you gave to me. Look at what she's doing. And because you are all both subject to, to, to Jesus Christ, who is head of the house, you are able to understand that, look, it is not me doing my will or having my way. It is God having his way in both our lives. And that is how we will maintain peace. Also, in different areas, maybe in terms of not just marriage, it could be in terms of business, anything at all. It could be even you driving your car and then somebody cutting in front of you. And you want to, you know, want to curse the person. You remember, not my will, but thy will be done. When our lives is focused on that principle, we will never go wrong. When it's like we are willing to put God first and everything last, you will never go wrong. So when Jesus Christ was praying and he says, and lead us not into temptation, what he was saying is, God, don't let my will be the rule of my life. You take over my life and I know that you will guide me. The Bible says that when the way of a man pleases the Lord, he makes his footsteps firm. And even though he stumbles, he will not fall. Why? Because the Lord will uphold him. You know, as a young man, <clears throat> that was, I'm still a young man, when I was younger, that was <clears throat> the particular verse that I based my life upon. That when the Lord delights in the will of a man, he will make his footsteps firm. That is, 
you, you will, it's like God, when, you, when God delights in you, God will be your guide. Yeah, you may make mistakes. Yes, you may stumble. But you know what? You will never fall. And when you understand that God is the one keeping your step firm, you are able to go out in boldness because you know that God will never allow you to fall. He will ne- av- never allow you is that to make a mistake when it comes to marriage. He will never allow you is that to is that to make a business to make a mistake when it comes to business or in any kind of association or whatever it is that you do. Why? Right? Because the Lord is guiding you. So I understood that, and it has worked for me all this while. So now let's go. To the second part. It says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. I am no English major, but I understand that when there is a but in something, it is signifying that what is about to happen is different from what has happened before. It's a conjunction that used to join things together. But when you, for example, when you say and, and seems like a continuation of what is already there. But when you say but, we are saying, ah, it is different from what was before. So, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. We've just said, when we are saying that, and lead us not into temptation, that God can be complicit. That God can actually lead us into temptation if we will not follow his will. That God will allow us to go through some things so that we can become better people. And we can look at the, at, the, at the story of Peter. Peter was a man who, who was self-confident. In himself, he thought, oh, I can do all things. But he just forgot about the Christ who strengthens me. And when Jesus Christ was telling him, ah, before the cock crows uh, this morning, he's like, uh, one of you, will, uh, Peter, you will, you, you will have denied me three times. He said, no way. Anybody else can fall. But me, no way. I am superhuman. And you know what happened? Exactly what Jesus Christ said was what came to pass. And you know why it happened? Why? Because Peter, while he had the opportunity, he could not pray. Even Jesus was going through, he knew that the challenge before him was such, it was not something that he wanted to do in the flesh. He wanted to be to grow old, to be 90, to be 100, like we all desire these days. But, you know what? God told him, look, for you, you are the exception to the norm. You can't grow old because you need to die young. Your death is for the redemption of the world. But it it was still a struggle. The flesh, it it was still struggling. So, and Jesus Christ realized that, "Ah, if I don't pray this thing away, I might force God to say, oh God, all right, look, I want to live long. So he cried to God. He prayed to God. He is like he is pushed into God such that the Bible says that the, the, the sweat coming coming out from him was like blood. That shows you the kind of stress when when you are your body is under extreme stress. That's when blood will come and sweat. Why? Because the capi- capillaries, the blood vessels under your skin, is like they are bursting. Because of so much pressure. You know, some people, they, act, it's like they actually die when, because when there's so much pressure, they act, their heart explodes. So Jesus Christ was under so much pressure. But he was able to withstand. Why? Because he prayed. When you're under pressure, you know what it means? You pray. When you're under pressure, that's not the time to be running around. That is the time to seek God and say, God, how do I get out of this pressure? Or if I'm under this pressure, what exactly are you intending to accomplish in my my life? Because understand, the most precious things in life, they are manufactured under pressure. You know that? Diamond. Diamond is just ordinary carbon that has been put under so much pressure that it became a gem. So sometimes, when God puts you under pressure, you need to understand what is going on. That God is only trying to make a jam out of your life. You know, you know how much people pay for diamond these days? A lot! Why? Because it's rare. God doesn't put everybody under that kind of pressure. 
But when God wants to do something significant in your life, I can assure you, pressure is part of it. You will always be under the constant pressure and temptation to want to work out. I've been through it. I mean, there was it about over 20 years ago now. It, it was for me, it was a crossroad. And it's like at that point in time, God had told me, leave your job. I want to start preparing for what I want you to do. And we just got married. And things were tough, extra tough. We were behind on rent, just everything. And God was saying, look, I want you to stop what you're doing and start working for me. It was tough. And you know, one day, my wife went to work. And she came back. And she had to walk through a field. And because the sh our shoes had holes in them, by the time she got back, every hour, our feet was wet. And it's like, at that point in time, I said, God, it's like I felt so bad. That here yeah, I'm sitting at home, my wife doing the work, and it's like she can't even afford good shoes. I felt like going out to work at that point in time. But I remember this. Not my will. Your will be done. I want you to understand this. If you are going to get any far with God, it has to be by your consistency in working with God. You don't just say today, not my will, but yours be done. And then tomorrow you say, God, God, let me have my way a bit. Ah, for the next one week. You know, there are times in my life when it's like, I maybe somebody did something to me. I really want to, hey, to fight back. Why? Because they fought me. And the natural tendency is to, hey, what, what, what? do you think I'm stupid? Or you think I can't fight to myself? But I remember, not my will, thy will be done. And understand that when God says, or when he prayed, but deliver us from the evil one, what he's saying there is this. If you have been able to walk as a Christian consistently in saying, Lord, not my will, but your will be done, it does not mean that the enemy cannot attack you or that the enemy cannot have some things in your life. I'm trying to explain this because it's very, very delicate. Some people, they say, ah, once you are a Christian, once you are saved, you are always saved. Praise God for that. But I want you to understand one thing. Some will say, once you are a Christian, the devil cannot harm you. The devil cannot put anything in your mind, in your life. The devil cannot touch you. It's possible too. But you know what? The reality is that the devil does harm us. The devil, he does touch us. And sometimes, when he touches us, what he afflicts us with is so much so bigger that we can do anything about it that we have to ask God to help us. I'm going to focus on two things today. I'm going to focus on deliverance and resistance. The Bible says, submit yourself unto God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. How many of us know that particular passage? When you submit yourself unto God, you resist the devil, he will flee from you. When you say, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. You know what you are saying? You are submitting to God. And once you are submitted to God, you have the authority, you have the power to resist the devil. Now, there is a difference between resistance and deliverance. The word that I, I can use to explain it is called tenure. Tenure is when you have, it's like a legal reason to be in a place. Resistance simply tells you that you resist something that is coming to you, but not yet in you. That's what resistance means. When the enemy comes and is like he is not he hasn't possessed you yet, you can resist him. But understand this: deliverance is when the enemy has hold of you. He's, he's got something in your life he can hold on to, and he won't let go until God gets his hands off your life. That's when you need deliverance. 
How, what, how does it come? Well, as Christians, we will need deliverance. Because, you know, the fact that you say, Oh, Lord, come into my life. Come and be my Lord and my Savior. Does not mean that before you were born, your parents, your grandparents, or maybe even ten generations ago, they had not gone into a covenant that have said, Hey, oh, Obanje, or oh, well, this whatever spirit, every children that come from me shall belong to you. You know what? It is a covenant sealed in blood. And it, regardless of whether you became born again or not, that covenant is still there. Sometimes, some people, you will see them, you look at them from top to toe, it's like they are wonderful Christians. They can pray, they can do anything. It's like when you look at them, you say, ah, this person is strong. Only for you to hear later on, oh, this person has done this. This person has done that. Oh, this person, and it's wonder, how can they do something like that? It is because the enemy is exercising his right of that covenant to undermine their lives. It can happen to anybody. It doesn't matter whether you are mature in the Lord or you are a, a, a little child in the Lord. As long as the, the devil has a reason to enter your life and take hold of you, he will use it when it is right for him. That's why Jesus Christ said that the prince of this world, he came to me, and what? He could not find anything of his in me. There was no covenant, nothing that enemy could use as an excuse to say, hey, Jesus, I'm going to grab hold of you. You know, when we talk about today's issues, some people suffer from lust. Some lust after women. Some people suffer from lust after men. Some people suffer from lust after cows and all those things. You know, it happens. No, it is true. But it's, not, it's like you wonder, how did they get to that point? Most times, it's not even their fault. They just realize it's just a weakness they could not fight. When you have a weakness, you cannot fight. You need divine help. That is why it is called deliverance. So Jesus Christ was saying, after you have stayed on the path, and you are saying, Lord, not my will, your will be done. And you have issues in your life that are seemingly trying to overwhelm you. You need deliverance. Resistance is what you can do. Jesus Christ said in Luke 10, 18, uh, 2, 10, 19, I have given you authority to trample upon snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the powers of the enemy. God has given you the power to resist. You don't need God to resist. I mean, you need God, but you don't need God to, to resist. You need God to help you resist, but you are the one, your responsibility is to resist. To say, devil, I reject you. When the enemy has not come into your life or does not have any hold upon your life to do anything in your life and he wants to come into your life, you say, hey, devil, this is my life. It belongs to God. You have no right to be here. So you tell the devil, Remove, vamos, vamos, vamos in Jesus' name. You know what? The devil has no choice but to go. But if the enemy is already inside you before you were born and is having a hold upon you, you need to ask God for help. Understand this. I won't go into the technical part today. You know, there are some deliverances that you can effect by praying for yourself. When you fast and when you pray and you seek God, God will deliver you. You don't need to go to any pastor. You don't need to go to anybody. But you know what? There are some instances where God has put the key of your deliverance into somebody's hand. For those ones, you can pray all you like until you go there to that place, you ain't getting anything. It is God still working deliverance. 
deliver us from the, the evil one. And there are times when God will do his own sovereign deliverance. He himself will come and he will deliver you straight away. No intermediaries. God can do whatever he wants. Now, because of time, I want to focus on one man. A story you know very well. It's the story of Naaman. Naaman was a Syrian soldier, and the story is as written in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 5, from 1 to 15. The story is very simple. Naaman was a Syrian general. He was a man of valor. He accomplished a lot of things. But he had one problem in his life. He was leprous. He was a leper. Now, I don't know how far that leprosy had progressed in his life. Because, you know, the leprosy is a progressive thing. It may start with just one dot, maybe on top of your, not your nose, but whoever is affected, or top of, top of your forehead, and then start developing and start expanding. At its worst, you start losing the extremities of your hands, so your fingers will go, your toes will go, your skin will become whatever. We don't know the extent to which Naaman was. Maybe in his own case, it wasn't too... Do I don't know. I really, really don't know, so don't quote me. It could be the worst kind. It could be just it, it, it hasn't progressed too much, so he was still able to maintain normal life. Or maybe his was has gotten to a stage where it's like it's not progressing worse or it's not getting any better. It's just on his, at the same stage. And then one Israelite girl that was taken as a slave became his servant and she preached the gospel to him. Ah, in my country where I come from, God is real. God can heal. God can, God can raise the dead. In fact, there is a man of God who has done that. He's called Elisha. I'm sure if you go to him, he will cleanse you of your leprosy. Ah, he will? No problem. So he went to the king. I said, I've got good news. There is somebody, a God, who can meet my needs. And he said, oh, is that, where is that God? He's in Israel. Okay. The king wrote a note. Here is my servant, Neman. He has come to be healed. Oh, king, make sure he gets his healing before coming back. <laughs> so, so the guy, Neman, took the, the letter and went to the king. You know, everything is about protocol. A king to another king. Everything is high, high up there. Because they are the high people used to talking high way. You know, when you go to all this uh, diplomatic and things like that, you look like a, a fish out of water. The kind of English or language you'll be speaking, you think, are they speaking Arabic? Yeah. Why? Because they are not in your class. So this guy went and came to the king. I said, king, um, this is a letter from my king. The guy read it and said, ah, this guy wants war. Who, who told this guy that I, I heal? Where, 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 where do you have the power? Is this guy trying to provoke me? That, that is where it's, when somebody is asking you to give them, commanding you to give them something they don't, you don't have, it's like somebody knocking on my door and said, David, give me one million pounds. I said, did you miss, I will tell you, did you miss the way? Except God has put down one million pounds while I'm, while I'm sleeping. And I don't have it. So he was asking the king to do something that he had no means of doing. So the king thought, oh, this guy is... Yeah. But you know what? As the, guy, the, the, the king was scratching his head and getting mad in his... He's like, Elijah heard about it. Elisha heard about it. King! Send him to me. He will know that there is a God in Israel. And he asked a servant. So the king said, yeah, Elijah, is your problem now. And you know what? By the time Naaman got to the door, he expected the protocol that you get from being in the diplomatic service. He expected the red carpet treatment that had been unfolded for him by the king. He expected that at least Elisha would invite him in, give him a cup of water, hospitality. But what did Elisha do? He did not even come out to meet him. 
You can imagine you traveling hundreds of miles from wherever you are just because you are seeking help. And then they are treating you shabbily like that. You, who are the commander of armies, you've, it, it, it's like it, your accomplishment goes before you. Wherever you go, people see you and they bow. And then you come before the man of God, he won't even come out. And of all things, he said, Oh, I've been told you, okay, you are sick. Go to River Jordan. Dip yourself seven times. You'll be healed. Bye bye. He didn't even come to say hello. Oh! The insult was just too much for Naaman. Now, I want to understand one thing. It's called God's insulting remedy. God's insulting remedy. What is, what is God's insulting remedy? It is when God has to insult you in order to heal you. Now, as far as Naaman was concerned, the only problem he had was leprosy. That was what what was there. But God knew that he had a bigger problem. You know what it is? Pride. You know, many of us, when we pray, oh Lord God, hear me. Oh Lord God, give me husband. Oh Lord God, give me a wife. Oh Lord God, do this for me. Oh Lord God, do that for me. Do you think God is not powerful enough to do it? God can do anything. But you know what? God is more interested in the bigger issue of what is going on in our mind. The Bible says that God humbles, I mean, God gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. So when there is proud in our heart, pride in our heart, and we are coming to God, say, God, give me this, give me that. The only thing God can see is the pride. He's not even looking at the need. He hates it. Because it reminds him of what the devil did to him. Pride was what, what caused the insurrection. So anytime he sees pride, he's always thinking, devil, 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 devil. That's the way God's minds work. So he has to address the pride first before he will now address the other needs. But how do you address pride? You don't address pride by pampering it. You address pride by busting it. You take it, pride is like a balloon. What do you do? You take a pin and puncture it. So when, Eli, uh, when, when um, Naaman, when he came and he was the I Almighty, oh, you must respect me, you must do this. Elijah, Elisha did the opposite. He pricked his ego. You are not even coming to my house. Your pride is a representation of your physical, is a spiritual leprosy that is your, 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 your outward leprosy is a manifestation of the leprosy that is within you. You know, let us you know what this means? That some of us, some of the problems that we think we have, they are just a manifestation of a greater problem within us. If we resolve those ones within us, the ones outside will resolve itself. There are people going through difficulties that are needless because they can't humble themselves. God said, all right, this is my condition for you. You want healing? Humble yourself. You want to sustain your marriage? Humble yourself. God will sustain your marriage. God will heal you. But if you don't humble yourself, you ain't getting anything. And you're not going anywhere. When, when Naaman, he realized that he had a choice. You know what he did? I'm going home. How dare these people don't treat me like that? I want you to understand this thing. Whoever you are, whatever you are, whatever you might have accomplished in the world, once your shadows darken the doorpost of the church, you are just a human being. Do you understand that? You, look, it doesn't matter whether it's you and your house help that you come together. The moment you come through the church door of the church, you are all the same thing before God. Remember Philemon? 
that Philemon was a servant, a slave of a master that ran away. But he still addressed him as brother. It is we that we strat stratify people. We classify them. We categorize them. Oh, you are this. Oh, you are that. Before God, we are all the same thing. We are all on the same level. That was the point God was making about Naaman. Yeah, he was a general. He was this, he was that. Wherever he went, everybody was bowing down to him. But when he comes to church, he must bow to God. And he struggled with it. If you struggle with seeing yourself as being on the same level as the other person, you are proud. Look, I am a surgeon. It doesn't matter whether you are a neurosurgeon or a tree surgeon. Before God, you know, there's this joke I usually try to tell to myself that, oh, it's like you have an African man who went to see his prospective father-in-law and they were introducing him and he said, oh, what do you do? Oh, I'm a surgeon. Oh, what kind of surgeon? I'm a tree surgeon. You know, he's like, <laughs> you know the way it is in Africa, he's like, when somebody, or let's say, or somebody says, oh, I'm a barrister. You know, these days in Africa, if you don't put whatever it is that you are, oh, I'm engineer this. If, oh, PRB, hey, 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 o -tutu, whatever, they put it there as a suffix to their names. So you can imagine somebody say, oh, oh my father-in-law, I'm a barrister. I say, oh, where do you work? Or which chamber do you work? Oh, Costa Coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, you can, we, 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 we rate ourselves by our accomplishments, by how people see us, by what people call us. But you know what God says? Before me, you are no different than the other person. It doesn't matter who you are outside the church. You know what? Outside the church, when you are in your domain, yes, I will give you your respect. For example, if I'm driving too fast, and it's like the police stop me, and they charge me to court, and you happen to be my judge, you know what? Even though if I'm your pastor, if I have to address you, I would have to say, my Lord. Why? Because that is your official capacity. I may now be cursing you later on when I get to my church. But at that point in time, you deserve that, same, that respect. But once you come to my church, I can call you brother whatever. Why? Because you are my brother. Whatever you are outside the church does not get inside the church in terms of respect. We will respect you for whatever it is that you are, but mostly because you are my brother in Christ. You, you, you are not allowed to look down upon me just because I am nobody outside. Because before God, I am somebody. The same blood that cleansed you and brought you to the kingdom was the same blood that washed me and cleansed me too. We are brothers. We need to understand that. You don't need to have superiority complex, a complex or inferiority complex. We are all the same thing. When we die, it's all six feet under. We are all going to stand before the throne of God. Nobody is better than the other person. Understand that. Don't feel inferior to anybody. And don't feel superior to anybody. Understand that? Let's continue. So, Naaman had to is like his, his lieutenant, they told, ah, Father, if the man of God had told you to go and do something great that will increase your ego, wouldn't you have done it? And he said, it's true, I would have done it. Well, so what does this, what, this doesn't take anything from you. Just go and have your bath. See it as if you're having your bath. And he said, okay, I will do it. But he hated River Jordan. He had already said, look, Abana, Papa, or Papa, the, the wonderful river of God, the one that is that angels dwell, that's where I should be going. It was River Jordan that he detested. That is the bitter pill. See, when God wants to bust your pride, he will give you a bitter pill. That's why the Bible says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. If you humble yourself, nobody will bust your bubble. Yeah, humble yourself. So, it, Naaman humbled himself eventually. And he went and 
dipped himself seven times. And then he came out. And as he was walking out, something happened. The water had washed away his leprosy. Why? Because humility had conquered his pride. You see, once the spiritual leprosy had been conquered, physical leprosy will go away. So, and the interesting thing was this. When God healed him, if I were God, or if it were me because of what he's been done, he's been doing, I'll give him a new skin, but I, I'm going to give him the skin of an old man. He will be, killed, he will be, he will be clean, clean, cleansed of his leprosy, but he will still have wrinkles like an old, his age. After all, maybe he was 40-something. Or 50 something. Like, look at me now, I still have the skin of a baby. <laughs> so, it's like, he, 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 but you know what God did? He said his skin was like that of a baby. You know what the skin of a baby is? Who? The, the collagen is still there. It's not like the way the older women, you know, beauty treatment and therapy has been known for a long, long time. They've been wanting, people have been wanting to recapture. Dear, youthful days, when their skin will do as it is told. It is soft, it is no pimple, nothing whatsoever. It was, he became the man with the best skin on that. Why? Because the Bible says God will do exceeding, abundantly, above all that you can think or imagine. God says, I will feed you with the best wheat. You see, God doesn't give you like for like. He will give you best for like. That was what God did. For Neman, all because you obeyed God. So I want you to understand that very simple. When God asks to insult you in order to heal you, it's because there are other secondary issues in your life that He needs to address. So when we say and deliver us from the evil one, you can see that. Sometimes before God needs to deliver us from the evil one, he needs to deliver us from ourselves. Because pride will get in the way of what God wants to do. Somebody who God was able to deliver easily without having to resort to busting his ego. Who was that person? The Roman centurion. Remember the story of the Roman centurion? Who says, ah, went to Jesus Christ. You no. Know, Look, look at it this way. When you are the, a commanding officer in an occupational army, an occupational army is one that has conquered your country. They've subjected it. They are the ones ruling over you. And when they, people are like that, they are usually is like um, they are oppressive. When a high commanding officer, somebody in control of 100 men, would come to Jesus Christ. He didn't come like Neman, Neman came. Oh, respect me. The Bible says that when he got to Jesus Christ, he bowed down. He put, he, he's like, he left his accomplishment at home because he knew he needed God. He bowed down before Jesus Christ and said, please, help me. I have a servant at home that needs healing, he's dying. Heal him, please. Oh, he said, come on, just, he, he just said, help me. And Jesus Christ assumed that, oh, you want me to come to your house? And Jesus Christ was about, ah, no, 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 don't bother coming to my house. You speak the word. Why? Because I am a soldier. I am an officer. When I tell Shumano, Shumano, go there. Shumano has no choice but to go. Abraham, jump there. He will jump. So I understand what military authority is. Now, I've realized that I've commanded my, my, my servant's sickness to go. Military power is not doing it. You, you have spiritual power. I've seen you command demons and they go. You can do what I can't do. Please do it. You don't need to come. Why? Because if you come into my house, you are a Jew. I'm a Gentile. 
you is like you become ceremonial and clean. He doesn't understand Jesus Christ that Jesus Christ is not unclean by what he touched. He, whatever he touches becomes clean. But that was his reasoning. So he said, Jesus Christ, you just speak the word. And Jesus Christ, my God, I have never seen such a kind of faith in Israel. Okay, go. He's healed. And that says that very hour, that guy was healed. You know why Jesus Christ did not have to put him through, go and do this, or go and do that? Because he humbled himself. So, let me ask you, what is it, that one thing, that God has to remove in your life in order for his greater glory to be seen in you? For Naaman, it was his pride. What is that thing that God is still struggling with in your life that he cannot forego, and you, if you are not willing to forego it, you will not be able to be all that God wants to be. Let us pray. Why don't you just pray, God? Lord, I humble myself before you today. <clears throat> Father, help me. Whatever it is that I've been holding on to, that has been the bane of my life. The spiritual leprosy that gave rise to the physical leprosy in my life. Father, Lord God, I bow before you today. I confess my sins. I yield myself to you. Lord, maybe I think, I've always been thinking, oh, because I'm richer. Or because I have more certificates. I have more qualifications. I'm better than the other person. And maybe I've even caused them to show, I've shown it in the way that I behave. Oh, Lord God, I repent today. From now onwards, Lord God, I am no better than anybody else. I am no worse than anybody else. I am just who I am in you, living by the grace of God. And deliver us from the evil one. Are you struggling with some issues in your life that need deliverance? You've resisted. You've resisted and resisted. But resistance has not worked. You've prayed and prayed and prayed. It doesn't seem to have worked. Why don't you ask, Lord God, send forth your deliverance unto me. However you choose to do it, Lord God, deliver me, O Lord God, in Jesus' mighty name. Lord God, prize even the fingers of the evil one out of my life. So, Because you said that he that the son set free is free indeed. Lord, let me be free indeed in Jesus' mighty name. Because the Bible says that it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. No longer to be subject to the yoke of slavery. Oh Lord God, I receive my total freedom in Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed. Father, Lord, we just want to bless your name. Because the entrance is what gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Lord, we've received your word once again. We now understand that, Lord God, sometimes in order to save us, you have to take us through situations that will deprive us of those things that are impediments to our miracles. Lord God, you have said in your word that when we humble ourselves, you will pour your grace upon us. Lord, tonight, today, we humble ourselves before you. Pour your grace. Deliver. Save by your mighty hand. So that our lives, Lord God, will reflect you and your glory in our lives. Thank you, Lord God, because you've answered our prayers, Lord. For in Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed. Amen. Amen.